All right, we're live. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is Thursday, February 3rd, 2022. We are the Senate Budget and Taxation uh, Committee Subcommittee on Health and Human Services. We have four budgets that we will review today uh, with the help of our phenomenal analysts from DLS. We're going to go in this order. We'll take up the budget first of the health, Maryland Health Benefit Exchange. We'll move to DHS Child Support Administration, followed by the Executive Department, Boards, Commissions, and Offices. And then we'll hear the military budget, uh, the military department's budget analyzed. So uh, with that, uh, colleagues, if there are no questions, we'll start with the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange. We have Mr. Andrew Garrison here. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Um, let me pull up the budget for the Health Benefit Exchange. And you all should be seeing that uh, on your screen now. Um, and of course, the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange uh, is the agency that works with the uh, Maryland Health Connection, uh, expanding opportunities for Marylanders to uh, get health insurance coverage through open enrollment. Um, and so what we're uh, looking at here um, on this front page is the changes that we're seeing in the budget. And there's two things I wanna highlight here. First, that uh, light blue bar at the very top of the 23 allowance, that's the young adult subsidy funding. Um, this is something that uh, was a legislative priority a few years ago, um, and it is actually gonna be starting in plan year 22. Um, and we have actually just received a budget amendment to bring that, those dollars in uh, to the 22 budget. Uh, so we are expecting that ultimately to wash out, but at, the, at this point, we only do have those dollars in for 23. Um, but again, it's something that's already in effect. We're gonna talk about that as well. And then the other big change that we're seeing in this budget here is for the reinsurance fund and the reinsurance program. Uh, that's a budget increase of about $30 million. Uh, we'll talk a lot more in depth about uh, where some of that funding is coming from and, and the use of that fund here. Um, but first, uh, as, as we kind of showed at the top, um, the operating side of this budget is actually fairly flat year over year. Um, and what that is split up in between is um, the enhancements and uh, operations of the Maryland Health Connection, uh, the actual platform for the exchange. Uh, and then there's some other expenses, um, the uh, call center uh, for the department, personnel expenses, other outreach, trying to get people to, to know that when open enrollment is happening and to enroll in health coverage. Um, again, the big changes we're looking at here are to that reinsurance program, um, that uh, $20 million that's populating in uh, for the young adult subsidy, and then the pass-through dollars are budgeted to increase as well uh, this year. And jumping into the reinsurance program in particular, uh, what we're showing here is uh, a sample of monthly premiums. And what, what, which we're, what we're showing is actually, this is the first year that we've seen a slight uptick in the, the anticipated premium costs um, since the reinsurance program has been um, in effect. However, it is still well down from prior to the reinsurance program, as you can see, let me actually get the uh, years on there. Um, and so in total, um, although it is a slight uptick, it is really kind of stabilizing around that lower value uh, for those sample monthly premiums um, that we're expecting in the marketplace. The other thing um, I wanna highlight, uh, uh, switching gears a little bit, is um, for some of the, the plans that we have in the state, the prevalence of the high deductible health plans, that's that HDHP that you're seeing uh, under exhibit five there. Uh, this was a JCR language that you all put in uh, last year, our committee narrative. Um, to look at uh, the prevalence of these high deductible health plans um, throughout the state. And uh, a few things to point out. Uh, first, the, the definition of a high deductible health plan is defined by the IRS, um, and it's actually fairly limiting uh, for individuals. It's about $1,400 a month, or pardon me, a year. Um, and, and so it's a fairly low bar, um, but you can see that all of the metal levels underneath gold uh, all of those have uh, those deductibles above that. Um, and then when we look at the gold plans, we see that at first it was kind of fairly rare to have those higher deductibles. Um, but in 2019, which is the last year that was looked at for this report, um, given some of the I'd say challenges with uh, looking at 2020 and the, the impact that the pandemic may have had on the marketplace, we're still seeing an increase in the, the share of those high deductible health plans. Um, even in that gold metal level, uh, we're still not seeing them at all for those the highest level of plans that we have, those platinum ones. 
Uh, and so we are asking uh, the exchange to comment uh, on the increasing share of uh, high deductible health plans uh, throughout the marketplace and any other actions that may be taken uh, to look at um, uh, look at the prevalence in the individual market. The other thing um, I want to highlight in this budget is back to that reinsurance program and really the cost of the reinsurance program. Um, as you all know, the, the reinsurance program uh, is funded through two different ways. Uh, there's federal pass-through dollars, and then there's also the state reinsurance fund. Uh, the state reinsurance fund is um, funded through an assessment on uh, carriers in the state. And uh, as of right now, that is set to expire at the end of calendar 23. However, there is legislation in front of you as introduced. Uh, Senate Bill 395 would extend that, uh, that assessment at its current rate through calendar 28. Um, but what we have in Exhibit 6 is really just focusing on those federal pass-through dollars. And for the first couple of years of the program, the, the federal savings um, and what ended up going into the state to fund this program actually exceeded uh, what ended up being spent in terms of the reinsurance program costs, which is the blue bar. And in calendar 21, that was going to be the first year that uh, we thought the costs of the program were actually going to be less than what the federal dollars ended up being. However, um, there was a provision in the American Rescue Plan that really increased the amount that the state received. Uh, the, the actual difference was close to about $140 million, in addition, uh, based on some of the American Rescue Act uh, savings. And so DLS is anticipating that some of those savings will, or, um, or additional pass-through savings to the federal government, will be provided again in 22. Of course, those provisions in ARPA aren't going to be extended beyond that. So we aren't considering that in the out years. But if you look at that 22 number, that um, that hash bar on your screen, so that second one is 107 additional million dollars um, that uh, we can anticipate the feds might provide uh, based on uh, the, ARP, the current ARPA provisions. And what that really does is it makes a difference into how deep we're gonna have to dip into the reinsurance fund itself um, to, to have enough funding for the reinsurance program. And we're showing that difference by those lines on your screen. So the green line is if we have those additional ARPA dollars coming in, and the blue line would be if it's closer to what the actuaries um, with the exchange forecasted um, back in July of this year. And the, the, the amount that we need to uh, dip into that reinsurance fund is then reflected now back into Exhibit 7 here. And this is now where we're looking at the state funds. Um, so the funds that came in from that provider assessment um, and into the reinsurance fund to, to back up some of those federal dollars and to keep that reinsurance program going. Uh, we've not only overlaid when we think we're going to need to be using the reinsurance fund after some of those federal pass through dollars have already been spent, but also some of the other uses of the fund that, uh, that have occurred. Uh, it was uh, at certain points it helped uh, fund different grants throughout the state, uh, the HERC grants and the Community Health Resource Commission, uh, as well as help with Medicaid provider assessments. Um, those were on a fiscal year basis. We've aligned them for calendar years in front of you here to be consistent. Um, and as the federal dollars uh, decrease and, and more state funds need to be used for that. We're going to expect to go further and further into the fund. Uh, as you see, we cut off here at 23. That's when that provider assessment ends under current statute um, and when we expect the program and funding to really pick up. However, again, there's legislation in front of you to keep that um, funding stream going to keep the program uh, going and keep the fund um, solvent. We are um, asking for uh, or recommending rather committee narrative. Uh, this is similar to what was uh, placed in this uh, on this budget last year, and there's kind of two parts of it. One is to keep the reporting on the reinsurance fund and that reinsurance program, um, and then the other aspect of that is to alert the budget committees of any uh, state innovation waivers that have been applied for, um, which would be needed to continue both um, the, that reinsurance program as well. Lastly, uh, in this budget, I do want to quickly highlight uh, some of the open enrollment results um, for the qualified health plans, again, through the connection. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, plan year 22 is actually the first year of the young adult subsidy. And where we would expect to see that impact is in the 18 to 25 year olds, as well as the 26 to 34 year olds on your screen. Um, and from plan year 21 to 22, we do see an increase uh, with the bulk of those groups. We saw an increase really throughout the in, um, different enrollment age categories. Um, but most of that increase is in those older young adults, uh, the 26 to 34 year olds. Uh, but broadly speaking, um, the number of Marylanders who enrolled in qualified health plan through this year's open enrollment were the highest that's ever been. 
Uh, this is in part due to you know, an extended enrollment period. Uh, open enrollment is actually still open through February uh, for plan year 22, um, but we, we are seeing a, a really high number of Marylanders enrolled, um, which is really great. Uh, and also we do have the uninsurance rates for the state overlaid in there. It is also worth highlighting that Maryland traditionally has one of the lowest um, or uninsured rate um, in the state uh, nationwide. The last thing uh, we're doing here in Exhibit 10 is we're looking at where we saw those enrollment increases from this open enrollment period uh, to the state's uninsured, uninsured rate. And we have that plotted um, uh, on the y-axis. And this was actually a report that uh, the exchange back in February of 21, really trying to look at a sort of post-COVID um, uninsured rate, um, thinking about maybe individuals who have lost coverage from an employer uh, if they were laid off of their job. And so they estimated that for us and we rolled it up by the county level. And then we looked at those open enrollment results. And so in the quadrant that we have on the upper left-hand side, those are jurisdictions that have a higher uninsured rate that we're estimating at this period. And also, unfortunately, had kind of a lower open enrollment increases, and we see a kind of a clustering around there, particularly some Western Maryland jurisdictions. And then on the bottom right-hand side, what we see is those higher open enrollment groups, but also lower uninsured groups. And we actually have a decent amount of the shore, as well as some central Maryland counties in there as well. Where we, where I think we want to see further growth would be in then the upper left, or pardon me, upper right-hand quadrant, um, which would be higher uninsured rate, but then also uh, higher open enrollment, so really getting coverage to those folks who need it there. Uh, of course, there's uh, some other various coverage in terms of um, being able to enroll uh, through the connection, um, and we discussed that uh, as well in here um, in, in some of the text uh, that the uh, that, that the exchange also uh, submitted a report on for you all. Um, but uh, in closing, uh, and again, our two recommendations here uh, are notification of any uh, waivers that are submitted by the exchange. And, and then continue reporting on that reinsurance program costs, um, particularly given that there is some legislation forward to either extend that assessment uh, and, and what impact that may have on the future of this program. That concludes my presentation on the exchange and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the subcommittee members? Don't see any, but I'm happy. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I was looking at it through the presentation view. <laughs> Senator Ecker, you can proceed. All right. Now I'm either going to show my ignorance or I'm trying to get my head around since I've been in other issues today about the, the reinsurance. Um, so the state developed a reinsurance fund um, to offset and to be able to offer the health benefit exchange, correct? To be able to keep down on compensated care. And by doing that, we also were able to recoup some federal funding. Is that right? Yes. So the, uh, and, and the exchange can certainly talk more in depth about the mechanics, um, but essentially the, the savings that we're able to offer the federal government through the reinsurance program um, is then passed through the state to help us fund that reinsurance program. And so we can keep those federal dollars and use them for reinsurance purposes as long as the program's in existence. And so we've actually been able to uh, sustain the, the reinsurance program and those costs just based on those federal dollars uh, thus far. And that reinsurance offsets the cost through the health benefit exchange, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and it is funded, the state's part is funded by the assessment on certain insurance carriers, correct? Correct. And all of them participate? Uh, the All the health insurance carriers? Uh, yes, I believe so. And it's at currently at a 1%. Okay. And it's at what point, um, what percentage is it now? Because it varied, didn't it? Um, it is currently at 1%. Um, and I think the exchange could certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it started at a 2.75 and ended up getting right. reduced because right. it was certainly more than enough funding at that point. We're currently forecasting it um, at around $110, $120 million a year from MIA based on what that 1% is yielding. And the bill before us um, will maintain it at 1%, Andrew? Correct, yes, uh, through 28. Okay, thank you. 
I just wanted to make sure I had that straight in my head. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Any additional questions? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you, Mr. Garrison. And we will now hear from Ms. Michelle Everly, who is the Executive Director of the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange. And good afternoon. I know you may have some team members with you. You're welcome to introduce them and respond to the analysis. Well, thank you, Chair Griffith. And uh, good afternoon, committee members. I do have with me today our uh, Chief Financial Officer, Tony, Tony Armager, our Chief of Staff, Andy Ratner, and our Policy Director, Johanna Fabian Marks. So they will be here uh, to answer any questions as we go through the presentation and afterwards. We appreciate the opportunity to address the committee today. And we're very grateful uh, and appreciative of Andrew Garrison for his thorough analysis. And we know that you know, he's jumped in with both feet this year and, and took over our, our uh, analysis, and we really appreciate the work he's done for us. Included in our response packet today, uh, we provided a presentation that we recently gave to our Board of Trustees in January, and it captures the enrollment period uh, outcome. Our open enrollment was supposed to end on January 15th. We've extended it through the end of February because of the spike in the Omicron variant. We saw that there was a lot of individuals age 50 and over that were heading into the hospital. So we wanted to make sure that we had coverage available for them. Now, I do wanna point out that presentation really talks about our open enrollment uh, period for our commercial uh, individual health products and dental products. But the budget that you're uh, looking at today also supports the work we do for Medicaid. And we provide uh, services to well over 1.2, in fact, I was on a Medicare call or Medicaid call today, and they actually said it was 1.5 million uh, Medicaid members. And we do their eligibility determinations, we do enrollment, uh, we do provider selection, customer service, outreach, handle the appeals, among other full service operations such as notices and such. So when you're looking at our budget, it's not only for commercial individual insurance and dental products, it also supports the majority of the Medicaid population. The mission of MHB is to improve the health and well-being of Marylanders by connecting them with high quality, affordable health coverage through innovative programs, technology, and consumer assistance. You'll see from the PowerPoint presentation we've included that we've done just that. A major component of what has allowed MHB to offer affordable health coverage is the innovative reinsurance program that we put in place with the help of the legislature in 2018. As you may recall, in 2018, we were facing uh, individual insurance rate increases of up to 50%. Rates had already risen 160% since the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Immediately after we implemented the reinsurance program, the average monthly premiums fell and they consistently fell to more than 30% over a three year period of time. The reinsurance program, along with technological innovation, our focus outreach and marketing efforts, and our consumer driven customer service have afforded more Marylanders with health insurance. In fact, for this plan year, 22 plan year, uh, over 181,000 uh, individuals, up 9% from 2021, obtained health coverage through Maryland Health Connection. And that's just what we refer to as on exchange. Another over 60,000 have enrolled directly with the individual insurance carrier. So that's nearly a quarter of a million Marylanders in the individual marketplace who've obtained high quality, affordable health insurance. That's an increase of 14% since January, 2020. Maryland, in fact, has the most affordable gold and bronze plan in the nation. On average, our plans are cheapest in the nation in the, the gold and bronze area. We have the third most affordable bronze plan in the nation. Now through the reinsurance program, 
we were able to reinvest $20 million of that assessment into a young adult subsidy program to better attract young people into uh, our enrollment pool. And as you know, when you look at a risk pool of people where you're spreading costs, you always wanna get that younger population that would be less of utilizers of healthcare than generally older population speaking. So the enrollment in that 26 to 34 age group grew 9% this open enrollment period. Another very important uh, consideration of the reinsurance is that the stable rates we brought to the marketplace have helped to shrink the gaps in health equity. We focus particularly on our Black and Hispanic populations, and they lacked health insurance at much higher rates um, than the general population in Maryland. We saw that for those populations, we had growth of a 10% in our Black community, 15, or 13% in our Hispanic community for 2022. Now, the other important factor to note is that our growth has been statewide. So the largest enrollment gains for the 22 plan year occurred in Carroll County, Hartford, uh, Anne Arundel, Baltimore, Prince George's, Howard, Calvert, and Charles counties, where we saw greater than 10% growth in all those counties. And that's another area we focus on, bringing coverage to all parts of the state and particularly the rural communities. The stabilized uh, market also um, propelled business and economic growth. We saw the three carriers that we have, uh, CareFirst, Kaiser, and United, all had growth in their enrollments. In fact, CareFirst saw a 5% increase in enrollments, Kaiser Permanente 3%, and United Healthcare that this year went statewide saw 472% growth in their enrollments. So we're driving economic growth to our state through this program. One concern of health plans continues to be the cost of the deductible. And we've talked about the high deductible health plan. We submitted a JCR report on that. What's important to note is that it's the IRS that defines what constitutes a high deductible health plan. The IRS established minimum deductibles for 2022 are 1,400 for self-only plans and 2,800 for family plans. Now, using that threshold, only five of our 34 plans offered through Maryland Health Connection qualify as low deductible health plans. The 10 silver plans we have have self-only deductibles ranging from 2250 to 6500. What's important to note, however, in the silver health plans is that most of the enrollees in those plans qualify for cost sharing reductions that are only available on the silver plans. So that further reduces their deductibles. We continue to see significant growth in plans at metal levels that do offer lower deductibles. For our 22 uh, enrollments, platinum enrollment grew 67%. That's our richest benefit plan. Gold enrollment, uh, 26%. And while the silver and bronze grew only six and 4%. Now, another important component of the reinsurance program that's allowed us to lower our rates is that because those rates are lower, our consumers are telling us they're able to buy up into richer benefit plans. So where in previous, they may have only been able to afford a silver plan with a higher deductible, they're now buying up to a gold plan, which is a, a lesser deductible, which is really great. We do have, as the exchange, very limited ability to adjust uh, the plan cost sharing parameters, meaning the de deductible and the out-of-pocket costs. The federal government sets what we refer to as an actuarial value for each plan, and the carriers are obligated to meet that actuarial value based on the metal tier of the plan. We call that the balloon effect. So if you uh, you have to only have so much parameters, so many parameters you can play with. So if you decrease the deductible, you may have to increase a co-share, uh, a co-insurance, a co-payment, or another out-of-pocket mechanism. So it's kind of like trying to find that, that area where we can keep those deductibles low, uh, yet not have other impacts on out-of-pocket costs. 
The uh, exchange did have an affordability work group. We heard loud and clear from consumers. We want low deductibles. So we introduced our value plans, which do offer lower deductibles. And we try and keep those as low as we can, meeting that actual ver actuarial value uh, guideline parameter set by the federal government. So just in closing, um, we will continue to look for ways to offer high quality, affordable health plans for Marylanders. And of course, we'll continue to report to the legislature on the reinsurance fund uh, and any impacts on premiums, uh, possibilities for continued implementation of the pro provider assessment, and any further necessary action to maintain the program, including uh, 1332 waivers. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the subcommittee? Okay, I just had a couple of quick questions and thank you for your presentation, the information and your responses to the analyst questions. I think you were getting to a question that I had. I was trying to get a sense and let me applaud you and your team and those that are doing enrollment, the number numbers of people that are covered in the state, really impressive. And um, having seen growth in my own jurisdiction uh, in terms of those covered is, is really something of value. I'm trying to get a sense though, in terms of practical application. First, if we have a sense of whether or not the increased insurance, what that's doing to utilization. And I know it's kind of a hard time to try to figure that out during a pandemic when people probably aren't doing primary and preventative care the way they used to or would during traditional times. And then I was getting, um, trying to follow your conversation and I don't yet have your PowerPoint, so I apologize if it's in there, but I was trying to, to follow your conversation about the deductibles versus co-pays and out-of-pocket expenses, mm -hmm. the gold, silver, platinum, all of that. So is that in the presentation that you have that, that, that we'll be able to find, or is that something we should talk about offline? Um, I, I don't, it's not specific in detail in the presentation. We can certainly get you more information, um, but in a nutshell there, and I'll use um, a, a gold plan because that's one that in the private area and employer marketplace we're, we're kind of familiar with. So generally a gold plan is an 80-20 plan. What used to be in history called an 80-20 plan. The insurance carrier would pay 80%, the consumer would pay 20%. So those actuarial values help define where that threshold is, that 80% or 20%. And there's a little bit of wiggle room on either end defined by the federal government. So in order to determine how much the consumer pays versus how much the carrier pays, that's where you look at what's the deductible, because you have to figure out that 20%. So what's the deductible, what's a co-pay, what's a co-insurance, what's the maximum out of pocket you can pay so that you're within that 80-20 range. So for a platinum plan, it's a 90-10, carrier would pay 90% on average, gold plan, it's 80, silver plan, it's 70, bronze plans, it's 60%. So when we talk about buying up to a richer plan, what we're really saying is that the insurance carrier will cover more of the cost and the consumer will cover less of the cost. And when we find that we were able to bring rates down, some of the variance in rates might only be $20 a month. So a consumer can say, well, instead of buying the silver plan with a $3,000 deductible, I can pay $20 more a month and get a gold plan with a $1,000 deductible. So that's what we mean by looking at that, but we're bound by those federal rules of where you can squeeze that balloon as we call it. Well, it's very impressive the response that we've gotten so far. And I, I can't imagine being one of the enrollment counselors trying to you know, do all of that calculating to get a person to the best plan for them and their family, but it sounds like you're getting there. Senator Eckert has a question. Thank you very much. And thank you, Michelle, for your presentation. I do look forward to getting that PowerPoint because I'm a very visual kind of person. So, and, I, and I know you've worked diligently to help us increase our enrollments down on the shore. So thanks for providing all that 
information so we know how to think about strategies moving forward. Um, I, but, and, and I'm a curious question. I noticed in your presentation, you were talking about, do you have prescription only coverage plans? Are they available through the carriers? So we do not have prescription only plans. So prescriptions okay. uh, coverage is part of our health plans. Correct. That's what I want. I just wanted to clarify that because I, I heard something and it stimulated another thought. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Senator. Are there any other questions? Okay, Ms. Eberly, I don't see any additional questions. So we thank you and your team and thank you to the analysts. That will conclude the hearing on the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange Budget. Thank you. Colleagues, we'll now turn to uh, DHS Child Support Administration. Um, we have Grace Pedersen as our analyst. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure to present the Department of Human Services Child Support Administration Fiscal 2023 Budget Analysis. Going to the first exhibit, the budget remains relatively level. There's a one, uh, almost $2 million increase um, the main thing here is that um, special, the special funds increase in the allowance from fiscal 2022, and this reflects the use of more child support reinvestment funds from the prior year. Um, the reinvestment funds will be used primarily on uh, personnel expenditures, and this offsets some general fund need and the associated matching federal funds. The notable thing about um, increasing the use of uh, the child support reinvestment funds is that these are not uh, matched with further federal funds like uh, general funded expenditures would be. The um, source of child support reinvestment funds are um, federal incentive payments for uh, performance against certain measures, and I'll talk about performance later in this presentation. Um, going to the next exhibit, um, looking at an overview of um, the agency spending in fiscal 23, uh, about half the budget is for personnel, followed by the next largest chunk being for cooperative reimbursement agreements, which is local governments taking on um, certain child support um, functions, and then the, the Baltimore City privatization contract. Looking uh, at this just the specific changes in the budget from fiscal 22. The largest changes for those cooperative reimbursement agreements with local governments, uh, followed by the central disbursement unit, which uh, manages the collections of support and then the distribution of the, um, the support paid. Uh, looking at personnel, uh, the number of positions remains flat, but notable here is that vacancies are about double the budgeted turnover rate. And um, this reflects the department wide uh, relatively high vacancy rate. Um, it's not unique to the Child Support Administration. And going to the issues, uh, the first issue is about child support performance. So I mentioned I'd talk about this earlier. Um, the state's child support performance is um, evaluated against five measures. So that includes paternity establishments, court order establishment, uh, collections on current support, uh, cases paying toward arrears, and then cost effectiveness. And the state's performance against these measures measures relative to other states' performance determines the amount of um, funding the federal government provides um, to the state, and that is those um, child support reinvestment funds that can be used to offset some general fund need. Looking at the state's performance in federal fiscal 21, the state exceeded its goal for uh, cases paying toward arrears, and it came close to meeting the goal for both current support collections and cases with support orders. Uh, the percent percent of cases um, with paternity establishment was lower than the goal, um, but DHS attributes this to uh, fathers having limited access to hospitals um, in this year. Looking at um, newly available data uh, for performance by jurisdiction indicates um, that some measures were difficult for um, some jurisdictions to meet than others. Um, the One of the more difficult ones to meet um, for more counties was current support collections, but um, 19 counties met the, uh, the goal for cases paying toward arrears. Uh, then the fifth, the fifth measure I haven't talked about yet is uh, cost effectiveness. So while uh, the national average cost effectiveness increase, 
from um, federal fiscal 19 to 2020, uh, the state's cost effectiveness decreased over this time and is a projected to further decrease in federal fiscal 21. Uh, national data for that year isn't available yet. Um, but the increase in um, the national average in federal fiscal 2020 was likely due to the um, ability to intercept the first um, federal stimulus payments for uh, collections on arrears. Uh, but um, subsequent um, stimulus payments weren't able to be intercepted. So um, collections in subsequent years return to normal levels. Um, this is the um, distribution of cost effectiveness by county. And there's some child support costs that are um, not easily, um, that don't increase proportionally um, with cases. So um, cases with high populations might have co more cost effectiveness for certain categories of child support um, costs than, than uh, counties with lower populations. Exhibit, uh, seven starts the uh, issue number two, and that discusses um, collections. So I alluded to this earlier, but um, federal fiscal 2020 was a really interesting year for collections, um, basically because of the interaction between enforcement measures and then certain policy changes during the pandemic. So um, with the um, the first iteration of stimulus payments, those could be intercept intercepted for um, past due support. So you see collections on arrearages were both um, high at the national level and, and for the state. Uh, collections on current support weren't affected by um, stimulus payments. So um, those remain relatively uh, level, um, even in federal fiscal 2020. Uh, this is looking at state data for collections. And you can see there, there is that bump for uh, federal fiscal 2020, but it returns to um, normal levels in federal fiscal 21. And exhibit uh, nine starts the third issue about uh, child support enforcement. So over the interim, the Department of Human Services uh, submitted a GCR on the various enforcement actions that it uses and whether it's required by the state or the federal government or both. And then the uh, thre thresholds at which each of those enforcement actions are applied. Um, so Exhibit 9 summarizes all those different enforcement actions that um, DHS uses. Exhibit 10 looks at the automated actions um, and whether, so these are actions that are automated, automatically applied with the, the legacy child support enforcement system and um, how many of those cases that received an enforcement action um, did receive collections in federal fiscal 21. And um, what's notable about this exhibit is that almost all of these automated actions received, um, almost all the cases that received these actions um, also received support, uh, received collections except for driver's license suspensions, um, which despite the application of that enforcement action, over 20% of cases did not receive uh, collections in that year. Something else that uh, the department noted in the GCR were uh, policies that other states use that Maryland does not. So two um, of the most widely used by other states are um, reporting of independent contractors to the state child support agency and the um, participation in the child support lien network. So reporting of independent contractors to the state's um, new hire registry um, does not currently happen. So basically um, independent contractors um, are not matched against um, the list of individuals that have support orders like other um, employees uh, might be. So um, collections can, are not captured against those, um, those earnings that independent contractors have. In the 2020 session, uh, the department submitted a bill that would have um, defined earnings as monies um, received by independent contractors, but that bill did not pass. Um, looking at the, um, the other policy is participation in the child support lien network. So this allows um, basically uh, individuals, it works with insurance companies to allow um, individuals that um, make an insurance claim to be matched against um, individuals with support orders. And um, if a claim is paid out, um, a portion of that claim could be um, garnished for overdue support. And um, what's notable about this is that um, 28 states participate in the network, including all the states that border Maryland. So um, 
going to the recommendations, uh, DLS recommends requesting a report on enforcement actions. And um, since um, this past interim, the only data that was available was automated actions um, because it was uh, utilizing the legacy child support system. Um, the new child support system is expected to be completed as part of the MD Think pro uh, project by the end of the current fiscal year. So um, with that new system, uh, this recommendation also requests that um, manually applied uh, enforcement actions and um, collections for those types of enforcement actions um, that data be submitted as well um, so we could we could see um, that data and whether those cases are receiving collections when they they have an enforcement action applied and the um, second recommendation is to request um, data again about uh, the child support performance and that concludes my presentation i'd be happy to take any questions thank you very much are there questions for ms Pedersen? Is that your hand up, Senator Eckert? Okay. Nope, I don't see any questions at this time. So thank you very much for that analysis. We're going to now hear from uh, the Secretary of the Department of Human Services, Secretary Padilla and her team are here. Good afternoon, Madam Secretary. Good afternoon. And thank you, Chairman Griffith and members of the committee for the opportunity to discuss the FY 2023 budget allowance for the Department of Human Services Child Support Administration. I have my team here with me today, Ms. Danik Cabred, Deputy Secretary for Programs, Kevin Goswide, Executive Director, Child Support Administration, and Stafford Chipongo, Chief Financial Officer. I want to thank Grace Peterson for her comprehensive and concise analysis. She's a pleasure to work with and we appreciate all her support. You have my written testimony, so I would, I would repeat here. Before I address the two recommended actions and five issues in the analysis, I do want to highlight some of our accomplishments. The department collected and distributed $543 million in child support last year. Of that, $160 million was distributed to families previously receiving temporary cash assistance, TCA, reducing the likelihood that those families will become dependent on the state for financial stability. As of the first quarter of federal fiscal year 2022, $124 million was collected and distributed in child support. Between the federal fiscal year 2019 and 2021, the amount collected per case has increased 8%, rising from 2,975 to 3,202. $218 per case. This $243 increase was achieved despite the total number of child support cases decreasing by 8% during the same three year. So what I'm saying is effectively, we collected more from less. Since 2015, the department has dispersed 4.9 million in gaming intercepts from video lottery winnings to pay past due child support as authorized by HB 907 in 2014. Finally, we believe the role of child support administration is more than just enforcement and collection. Our goal is to help and support non-custodial parents in their efforts to secure gainful employment so they can meet their obligations. To that end, the Step Up program continues to be a success. This program and others like it provides eligible, unemployed, or underemployed non-custodial parents with assistance in obtaining employment that will enable them to achieve economic self-sufficiency and to meet their child support obligations. That concludes my testimony, my remarks. Now, with your permission, I would move directly to the recommended actions and issues in the analysis. Thank you. Yes. 
The DLS analysis contains two recommended actions. The department concurs with the recommendations. Now turning from the recommended actions to the five issues for discussion, in response to issue one regarding the department providing periodic reports of five child support performance measure, the department concurs with the analyst recommendation. In response to issue two regarding the anticipated impact on cost effectiveness with the, with the deployment of the new child support system, the department does anticipate increased cost effectiveness when the new cloud-based child support management system is fully deployed and the legacy system is decommissioned. In response to issue three regarding regional factors, which might impact cost effectiveness, the department believes they are regional factors that may impact cost effectiveness, including economic community trends and employment opportunities available for non-custodial parents, which can increase or decrease the collections. The department does monitor agency costs for child support to ensure they are reasonable and necessary to program activities. To promote best practices across the state and increase timely receipt of collection, the Child Support Administration provides local office guidance for managing cases to address a family's needs in a holistic manner, follows federal protocol to open and close cases, and uses customer outreach and informants rem remedies as appropriate. In response to issue four, regarding the department providing updated data on collections among both automated and manual actions, the department concurs with the analyst's recommendation. In response to issue five, regarding DHS plans for participating in the child support lien network, the department is interested in participating in the lien network or similar services if available, and the department supports the passage of state legislation that would authorize our participation. This concludes my testimony and response, and I will be happy to address any questions that committee may have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any questions, subcommittee members? Okay, seeing none, Madam Secretary, I just uh, had one question. I wanted to go back. The um, Ms. Patterson talked to us a little bit about vacancies, and I, I, you know, I have seen in the analysis the way that the agency has improved collection of arrearages using technology and, you know, other resources that have been made available to you. I wonder how much our collection of, of the current collections and even some of the arrearages might be hampered by the vacancies. Is that a factor? Well, I can say that the department has indeed been impacted by the pandemic, right? Like the rest of the world, we felt the effects of this pandemic here in Maryland. This, this is a national trend. Despite those challenges, we have been able to retain and recruit staff. And as you said, we have been able to um, deliver and collect the child support and we did so while ensuring the vital services and assistance we must stop for the most um, vulnerable city Marylanders, providing reassurance that their needs would continue to be met by our department. And as, as I stated, when we do the overview, the option to telework is new and fluid to our department and has been positively uh, received by staff. Uh, my executive director here meets with um, the, all the 24 directors of child support to discuss strategies for recruitment and retention. And, um, the pandemic has had a greater impact than staffing. And um, to, 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 your specific, to um, respond to your specific question, I'm going to ask my director here to elaborate on, on that. Thank you, Secretary. Yes, Secretary, it's true. Um, during the pandemic, obviously, we had a lot of different challenges um, due to the various partnerships we have, um, due to the closures of offices, closures of the courts. Um, they all impacted our various measures, such as establishment of orders, finally, as well as um, collections. Um, there are many uh, non-custodial parents who lost employment 
And while we did get some money through the stimulus as well as unemployment opportunities, uh, we were not able to modify orders uh, as quickly during the pandemic to help bring those orders down. And that also impacted our ability to collect on, on collections um, and our peers. Thank you very much. We're gonna, I suspect we'll be having conversations around vacancy for the foreseeable future, not just in your department, but across the state and um, hoping that together we can come up with some solutions, maybe uh, hearing your previous comments, maybe helping some of these folks find jobs in state government. So um, thank you, Madam Secretary and your team. I don't see any additional questions for the subcommittee. So we thank the analyst and thank the Department of Human Services. That will conclude that budget hearing on child support administration. Colleagues will now turn to executive department, boards, commissions, and offices. We have as analyst Kelly Norton. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, this is the analysis for the executive department boards, commission and offices. Uh, for fiscal 23, the budget increases approximately 880,000 to 16.8 million. There is a proposed deficiency appropriation supplement for fiscal 22 um, that will support the expenses for autism strategies, the commission on lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer affairs in the office of immigrant immigrant affairs at the governor's office of community initiatives, as well as restoration of turnover at the governor's coordinating offices shared services unit. Uh, the majority of the spending for the agency is going towards the governor's office of community initiatives with 61% of the budget followed by the state ethics commission. Most of the change of the 880,000 is being pushed by an increase in personnel expenses, such as turnover adjustments and reclassification and salary increases, as well as the funding for the Maryland Core program fund that was with legislation enacted in 2021, uh, mandating funding to the program, which is to provide stipends and scholarships to young adults, as well as an update to the online training and filing system for financial disclosure for state employees additional funding for volunteer stipends and AmeriCorps grants. The first issue being covered is the minority business enterprise participation concerns. Exhibit three shows that the state has continuously fallen short of its MBE participation goal and is projected to do so in fiscal 23 as well. Um, there was no data for 21 at the time of writing this analysis. In the, the Participation uh, goal is below the current goal of 29%, as well as the previous goal of 25%. In June of 2021, GOESBA launched its agency MBE participation attainment survey. Of the 60 agencies that provided responses, 83% have not reached the 29% participation goal, and 17% have reached the goal. Also of the agencies that responded to the survey, 90% of them have had staff attend GOESBA trainings and 68% have had staff attend the Maryland Procurement Academy training. In addition to the agency MBE participation attainment survey, GOESBA conducted the agency survey one. Of the 60 agencies that responded to this survey, 87% have filled their MBE liaison positions and 13% uh, still have vacancies. In addition to that, to that, the MBA liaisons identify MBE as their secondary responsibility, over 60% have done so, while 37% uh, identify as their primary responsibility. Goes what should be prepared to detail what steps the agency can take to increase MBE participation by state agencies. 
And the MBE Participation Attainment Survey report raised the idea that GOSBA should provide training to MBEs on how to start a business, register a business, and things of this nature. While GOSBA noted that is usually the role of a business consultant, it does provide technical training classroom webinars through its website aimed at small businesses. Uh, focus on outreach and training for MBEs and potential MBEs might help increase MBE participation. DLS recommends the adoption of committee narrative requesting that goes but continue the MBE participa participation attainment and agency liaison surveys, as well as track the participants of its free webinars and outreach events. The second issue is related to the Office of Legislative Audits report on state grants. In November, the Office of Legislative Audits released the audit of state grants that was initiated after identifying various issues with the awarding, uh, awarding and monitoring of state grants. Uh, the Governor's Grants Office role was examined as one of several executive departments involved in overseeing state's grants. The Grants Office primarily acts as a public repository of available state grants. The audit overall had six findings, three of which were directed at the grants office. The first finding being the state does not have statewide comprehensive laws or policies governing the life cycle of state grants. The second finding, um, there is a lack of standardized grant applications and grant agreements. And third, there is not a statewide grants management system to help administer and track grant awards. The Office of Legislative Audits recommends that the Grants Office and the Department of Budget and Management address these, these findings under the, the direction of the Maryland Efficient Grant Application Council, also known as Mega Council, which is chaired by the Grants Office Director. The Grants Office has agreed to the audit's findings and recommendations and plans to incorporate the recommendations into the Mega Council's final report uh, due in July 2024. The Grants Office is currently addressing finding three, the need for a grants management system. 10.5 million has been appropriate for the GGO Enterprise Grants Management Solutions. Um, they had chosen a vendor, but the contract was not approved by the Board of Public Works. Uh, the Grants Office should be prepared to brief the Budget Committee on the status of the Information Technology EGMS project and how it will address the concerns raised by the audit. The final issue is the Maryland State Commission on Criminal Sentencing Policy Guidelines and Racial Biases. Uh, the Sentencing Commission is currently updating the sentencing guidelines for specific cell ranges of the existing sentencing matrix for drug offenses and the sentencing matrix for property offenses. The commission has approved the amendments and guidelines should take effect July 1st, 2022. The guidelines are updated to keep up with sentencing trends, uh, which allows the commission to revise the guidelines to align with current judicial practices. However, presently, there is no consideration if, trends, if sentencing trends reinforce racial biases in sentencing. And with Maryland's sentence population being 72% Black, despite Blacks only composing 29.5% of the state's population, uh, this issue is worth uh, exploring further. The commission should discuss how it can address this concern with sentencing guidelines in the future. And DLS recommends a report detailing a plan to, the, to study the extent to which racial bias is present in state sentencing. In summation, there are three recommended actions, a committee narrative requesting a report on goals bus training and outreach events, a committee narrative requesting the continuance of the MBE participation attainment and agency liaison surveys, and a committee narrative requesting a plan for studying racial biases and sentencing. That concludes my presentation, and I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you very much for your report and analysis and recommendations. I'm looking to see if there are any questions from the subcommittee. And I don't see any. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, turn, I have a list of, of names for agency representatives, but I, I believe we'll start with Mr. Patrick Lally, who is uh, yes, Madam Chair. You have your group here and can- I have the whole, the whole roster. Fantastic. With your concurrence, I'll introduce them. Absolutely. Thanks. Well, let me begin by just saying good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Patrick Lally. I'm the Senior Executive Director of the Governor's Coordinating Offices, Shared Services. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your consideration this afternoon as we testify on the budget for uh, the proposed budget for boards, commissions, and offices. So with me at the table here in real time is uh, Executive Director Stephen McAdams of the Governor's Office of Community Initiatives. Special, Se Se Special Secretary Jim Murray <clears throat> of the Governor's Office of Small, Minority, and Women Business Affairs, and Jennifer Colton, who is the Director of the Governor's Grants Office. And then uh, participating virtually are Jennifer Alger, the Executive Director of the Maryland State Ethics Commission, Harry Chase, the Executive Director of the Healthcare Alternative Dispute Resolution Office. I want my 28 years for my 28th year. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Harry. I was just waiting for that. Okay. <laughs> David Soule, who's the Executive Director of the Maryland State Commission on Criminal Sentencing Policy. Erica Snipes, the Executive Director of the State Labor Relations Boards, and Bethany Brinkley, who's the Chairwoman of the State Board of Contract Appeals. Madam Chair, I'd also like to thank in particular Kelly Norton, our analyst, for her hard work and her acknowledgement of our own efforts through this analysis. I will tell you that everyone here concurs that she is a pleasure to work with. I'm happy to tell you that the analyst has concluded that the boards, commissions, and offices have put forth another responsible spending plan for fiscal year 2023. By instituting various cost-saving measures, the governor believes that it is important that the boards, commissions, and offices follow the same uh, responsible fiscal spending plan that he expects from all agencies of state government. <clears throat> uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to make an official comment that we are in support of the analyst's recommendations to concur with the governor's allowance for our offices. Um, also, we've provided written testimony for your review and my colleagues are here to respond to any questions you may have. Um, if you prefer to wait <clears throat> until my colleagues have made their comments, um, then with your concurrence, I'll turn it over to Special Secretary Ray. Sure, let me just pause there because if there are questions from the subcommittee, we may be able to get them out and then you can envelop them in your responses. As you wish. Yeah, so any questions, Senator? Okay, I do have one and, and Secretary Reed knows it's coming. How are we doing? I keep getting these analysis and I keep getting uh, evaluation reports and it seems that we still have so much work to do and that the numbers are moving in the wrong direction. So I hope you can speak to that and to Ms. Brinkley, I just wanted to hear uh, in terms of contract appeals, how we are in terms of backlog and uh, whether or not there are opportunities for us to diversify representation on that board um, just as an opportunity as connected to my questions to Secretary Rees sort of indirectly. And um, yeah, so I'll stop there for now and allow you to proceed in the order that you had prepared. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. It's great to see you again. And I will address the question after the presentation and uh, your question is right on. Uh, many first, thank you and the members of the uh, subcommittee for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, there were several items mentioned in the analysis regarding MBE participation and goals bus role. So I would address them in the order presented. Now you asked that goals but be prepared to detail what steps the agency can take to increase MBE participation by state agencies. Goals bus role as an oversight agency is limited to data collection education and training and advocacy. The process concerning contract by contract determination regarding NBE inclusion occurs at the agency level. Beyond collecting, analyzing and reporting NBE performance data, GOSBA creates the NBE program's framework, policies and processes for goal setting and application. We are confident in the sufficiency of the existing MBE relevant statutes and policies, however. But goes by is not, we're not positioned to provide 
that step-by-step -step process to increase NBA participation by state agencies since the goal-setting function is an independent responsibility performance during the procurement process. The guidelines on this activity already exist. Currently, the BPW Advisory 2001-1 titled Procurement Review Group SDR Designation, MBE and VSDE Determination instructs agencies on the process for determining social economic preference and provides a structure for maximizing MBE goals and sub-goals on a contract-by-contract -contract basis. The MBE program success is dependent upon each agency's level of implementation and enforcement. And that's a very important statement. Implementation of the MBE program is a decentralized process. Improvements should happen at the fundamental level across the agency's MBE input process and output workflows. A chart outlining responsibilities along with our recommendations has been provided in our written our response. Uh, but our primary recommendations are to number one, increase transparency through better goal setting tools. Two, improve NBE compliance at the contract level. And three, increase enforcement and accountability of NBE goals at the agency level. The day-to-day -day work involved at each level of the NBA workflow is robust and voluminous. Goldsbach's current NBA compliance staff, which is comprised of two managers, is simply not in position to participate in the daily procurement activities of the 70 participating agencies. Now, in addition, the Department of Legislative Services, DLS, recommends the adoption of committees narrative requesting that goes by continue to conduct and report the findings of the MBA participation and liaison attachment surveys in order to monitor the state's progress towards achieving its MBA goals. In addition, goes by should track the participants of its free webinars and outreach events throughout the fiscal 2022 and 2023 and report the data to the committees. We concur with that recommendation from DLS and will continue to conduct and report the findings of the MBE participants and liaison survey uh, attainment surveys. Now, in addition, we will track and report the participation of our free webinars and outreach events through fiscal 2022 and 2023. So I will be happy to respond to any questions that you may have. I want to thank you again. And my colleague, Jan Colton, will respond to the next item. Before um, we go ahead. Move on from you. Um, let, yeah, before we move on from Special Secretary Rhee, I know that Senator Eckert and I both served on the President's Work Group on Equity and Inclusion. Spent a lot of time with you, uh, Secretary Rhee, and your team, and hear your concerns again loud and clear. Uh, we actually put in legislation to address some of the barriers that you just described. Unfortunately, the legislation wasn't successful. But there are a number of bills that have been introduced before the full budget and tax committee this session. So we hope that you and your team, your very lean team, will take an opportunity to look at those proposals that members have put forth and let us know uh, which ones might be helpful in terms of addressing this recurring challenge that we, we seem to be talking about year after year. So thank you for your responses. Senator Eckert, did you have anything to add? Okay. Thank you, sorry, uh, is it Ms. Colton? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good okay. afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and good members afternoon. of the subcommittee. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, address the committee this afternoon. Um, I have submitted to a uh, written testimony, but would like to briefly discuss um, the efforts underway regarding the procurement of an enterprise-wide grants management system, also will be referred to as EGMS. Uh, we strongly believe that with the implementation of the EGMS, Maryland will not only eliminate cumbersome duplicative systems, but expand its portfolio of grant revenue, improve compliance, increase uh, program performance, and establish 
clear uniform standards, forms, uh, applications and agreements, which are a benefit to all state agencies, applicants and recipients. The project goals and objectives directly align with and respond to the various challenges and recommendations made by the OLA uh, performance audit and as well um, the observations and recommendations that were provided by the mega council in the year end report that was submitted to the General Assembly the end of December uh, 21. As you know, uh, or likely know, the procurement evaluation committee for the EGMS project had recommended a vendor uh, for award, but the item was not approved by the Board of Public Works in December of two, uh, 2021. Members did cite concerns uh, with the procurement process, but offered a very strong endorsement of the need for the project. Uh, the governor's grants office is working with the Office of State Procurement on an update and re-release of the RFP um, based on, you know, the procurement process last year, the evaluations uh, committee's, you know, findings and experience, the vendor questions that might have come up through, along the way. Um, a procurement officer has been assigned to the project, and our project team internally continues to work in preparation of the implement, uh, implementation. Um, now, as often is the case with procurements, we are unable to predict uh, when specifically uh, this item will come before the BPW again, uh, as there are many factors outside of the governor's grant office control. In the meantime, I wanna assure you that the GGO is working on behalf of the mega council and through the EGMS project team uh, to continue our efforts in preparation of this very important project. Um, a link to the Mega Council report and the OLA audit was provided in my written testimony and can be found on our website at grants.maryland.gov. And the Governor's Grants Office and Mega Council will continue to also work with OSP, DBM, and uh, the Department of IT in pursuit of resolution to the challenges noted in both of the reports. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have or turn it over to my colleague. Okay, questions for Ms. Colton? I, I just have one and, and you've kind of addressed it, so it's not really a question, it's more of a request. Um, would love to have you keep us up to date as this process, you know, with the, the RFP and the vendor selection and all of that progresses because, I mean, if I read the analysis report and your response correctly, we're talking about billions of dollars. Um, you are correct, Bob. And uh, you may recall that you and I met uh, several years back when uh, I first joined this office in an effort to obtain budget funds for this project. And this was probably, this was prior to COVID. So uh, the effort to bring this uh, solution to the state has been, um, you know, uh, an ongoing effort. And I will also note that in this round of evaluation, we have sought to include external participation from a nonprofit representative uh, to get, you know, community stakeholder engagement in the evaluation as well. And we have technical advisors and other subject matter experts across the state agencies to participate in the review. I mean, we had a lot of that in this past review, but the new factor would be the nonprofit representative, which is supportive of the you know, the areas that have been outlined in the mega council report. And if you haven't taken a look at it, um, you know, please uh, give it a glance and I'm happy to follow up with you directly um, as this project um, continues. Now, please do. I did just get the link and I do remember just being as passionate about this conversation a few years ago as I am today, only now that time has passed, it's a little, even a little more frustrating that we haven't haven't been able to make progress in, in the time that's passed. So definitely we'll- You are preaching to the choir. <laughs> I <laughs> yes. appreciate the sentiment, uh, I do, and I will be in touch for sure. Okay, thanks. So you can introduce the next- Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I will introduce uh, my colleague, David Soleil, and he will address the next item. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. Thank you. I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak with you all today. I also want to take the opportunity to thank Kelly, Ms. Kelly Norton for her work on the analysis. The MSCCSP or uh, Maryland State, which is short for the Maryland State Commission on Criminal Sentencing Policy or Sentencing Commission uh, submitted written testimony in advance. Uh, my comments today will focus on addressing concerns that were out, uh, outlined on page 11 of the analysis regarding sentencing guidelines and racial biases. Specifically, I want to know that, note that the Sentencing Commission is already engaged in the study of racial disparities at sentencing. An analysis of offender and offense score characteristics by race, ethnicity, and gender was presented to the Sentencing Commission for its review at a uh, December 2021 meeting. Further, those analyses were also presented at the, uh, to the Judiciary's Equal Justice Committee Sentencing Subcommittee uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, accordingly, the Sentencing Commission concurs with the analyst's recommendation. The Sentencing Commission is encouraged that DLS shares the same concerns, and we are certainly willing to share the results of the analyses and to include additional analyses that we are already planned on completing um, early in 2022, and to include those additional analyses um, via report as requested by July 15th, 2022. So to that end, I am happy to respond to any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. You responded to mine, just keep us posted. And uh, I don't see any other questions for the from the subcommittee. So thank you for your presentation. Are there others to share with the subcommittee? Introduce. I think. Was that Madam it, Chair. Mr. Lally? No, yeah, Madam Chair, I just was, did you have a question for uh, Chairwoman Brinkley? Yes, I, I actually had a group meet with me um, a little while back and they talked about um, just the need to sort of diversify membership on the contracts, uh, contract appeal board. Thank you for reminding me of that. And I also uh, was wondering if we had any sense of what the back backlog, if there is any um, with cases on that board. Well, good afternoon, Senator. Can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Okay, good afternoon to you as well as all of the other members of the subcommittee. Um, I, first, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to address your questions. It's very rare that we have questions. So it's, it's nice to actually get to speak up and, and be recognized for a change because we us usually operate in the background and people don't pay a whole lot of attention to us. So thank you. Um, I wanna start by at answering or trying to answer your question about the diversity issue on the board. Uh, we currently have three board members, and this is all established by law. It's it's all set forth in the statute. And one of the, the problems I think that the administration encounters, and I would assume it's every administration, is that it's, it's often hard to attract board members to take an interest in this particular position, in part because the law requires that board members be uh, qualified, proficient, and experienced in the procurement law. There's not a lot of um, people who are out there that can satisfy that requirement. Um, but also, and, and I think this is, is becoming more of an issue, uh, the term period for board members is only five years. It's a very short term period. And the, the main reason that that's an issue is because if you, you probably know this, in order to vest for a pension, it's, it's a 10 year vesting period. So lawyers in particular are often reluctant to walk away from private practice and take this type of position when there's no guarantee they're ever going to be vested for pension. Um, and you know, for, for just a short five year term, you know, they'd rather stay in private practice. So I know that every year when we're looking at appointments and reappointments, it's hard to find candidates who are qualified, number one, and number two, who are interested because of, of that concern. So I do want to mention that um, as, as far as the diversification or the diversity, um, 
I think, and I, and my clerk is on, my senior clerk is on the phone, is on the Zoom call with us. So I, I'm going to ask him to chime in if I'm incorrect on this, but I, I believe I am actually the first woman chairman of the board in its history. So we are trying to make some strides and making sure at least women are getting on the, on the board. Um, again, without people who are, who can meet the qualifications, it's, it's just really hard to attract talented, qualified, experienced um, board members who have the requisite qualifications required by law. So I'm hoping that, that that answers your question on diversity. It actually dovetails into- It does, and we can, before, yeah, before you move off of that, it really does answer some questions that I have. The really cool part of this is we are lawmakers and we're in a position yeah. to modify. <laughs> we can well, change a law, so- I'm, and this is why I'm so excited to be able to speak up. Um, it actually dovetails into another concern of ours that actually addresses your, the backlog question. And, and I, I, I have to say, that's very astute of you to ask those two questions because they really are inter, uh, intertwined. So um, we, we have experienced some, back, in some, some backlog. A lot of the, we've tried to follow the lead of the judiciary. When they're not having trials, we haven't really been comfortable having trials either. And most of our participants, the litigants who appear in front of us, they've been reluctant to want to come before the board for hearings and trials as well. So a lot of the, particularly the bid protests uh, have been stacking up, so to speak. Uh, since the COVID restrictions lifted, we've been diligently trying to knock out those back backlog. In fact, if you were to look at our website, you would see that we've actually issued three decisions in the last month, I believe, during the month of January to try to get caught up. And this is where this links in with the diversity on the board. Um, the we're anticipating based on the new law that was passed last year with respect to sports wagering uh, a, a significant increase in new protests coming in the door at some point, probably in the near future, because that the jurisdiction to hear protests relating to those license applications now comes to us and falls, in, falls with us. And the way that the law is written, it requires us to put those, so to speak, on the front burner and procurement winds up going on the back burner. And there's only three of us. And so it's becoming a, a significant concern to us that we are quickly going to create a choke point uh, in procurement in particular, as well as possibly with the licensing issues and the sports, sports wagering, because we can only work so fast. We would like to see more board members to be able to handle the influx that we're anticipating receiving. Um, you know, we don't know any, we're proficient in, in procurement. We don't know anything about licensing. That's not to say we can't learn it, but it takes time. And so it's time that we don't have, if we're going to get, I don't know how many bid pro, or not bid protests, but license application protests coming in the door. And those will be coming in all at one time, as opposed to trickling in over time, which is what happens with procurement. So as soon as that floodgate opens and we get those sports wagering protests, procurement's going to go on the back burner and we're going to be focused solely on those sports wagering license application protests because that's that's what the law requires. I don't know, I can't predict what that's going to look like, but it's a significant concern to us. I've I've raised the red flag and said we're going to be we're going to need a bigger boat. Um, and I'm hoping that somebody hears us and somebody pays attention before it does create a significant issue and a significant backlog. Right now we're working as fast as we can to get caught up so that we don't have a full load when that occurs, but we see it coming and um, are very concerned about that. So I just wanted to be, take the opportunity to make you aware, make the subcommittee aware that um, you know we're working to get, get, get our backlog taken care of. Uh, we're making progress, but I think that we're really going to need some assistance in the near future once those um, applica license application protests come, come in the door. Oh, and I, I, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, yesterday during the House subcommittee, there, were question, there was a lot of discussion about um, the decrease or the inability to meet the MBE participation goal for this year. And I believe they said last year as well. Um, I just want to speak to that because 
we issue a lot of opinions on those the, relating to the MBE program. And in fact, the last two opinions that we issued in the last week related to MBE participation and some of the unintended consequences that have that we're seeing as a result of the way the laws and regulations are written regarding the MBE program. So if anybody wants to know more information about what we think in that regard, they might wanna take a look at those last two opinions we just issued during the month of January. They're on our website um, to get a better understanding of what these unintended consequences are that we speak about in our opinions. And I'm happy to share those with anybody who wants them, if anybody's interested in reading them. They're not very long, but hopefully, um, that could answer some questions or at least provide some additional information. So thank you very if much. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Uh, Senator Eckert. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you have those opinions, we would welcome them. Um, get them to the chair, to our staff. I yeah, if you can get them to Philip right. Anthony and Budget and Tax Committee, we you. can make sure subcommittee gets them. Thank you, Senator. I was I right on there. I Right. Absolutely. We'll provide those to you. My clerk just let me know that he can send those via email. So we will get those out as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. And thank you for your comment. We are listening. Thank you so much for hearing us. I really do appreciate the opportunity to, to try to answer your questions. Okay. Well, I don't see any additional questions from the subcommittee for this group. So we will thank um, the analyst, Ms. Norton. Thank you to all of the presenters. That concludes the briefing on executive departments, boards, commissions, and offices. Um, so thank you all very much. We're now going to turn to the military department and our budget analyst is Madeline Miller. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm now going to share my screen. Um, are you all able to see a PDF? Great. Um, I am going to present uh, the analysis of the military department's operating budget today. Uh, the fiscal 2023 budget increases $1.5 million or about 4.9% um, to $31.7 million. Most of the increase comes from additional federal funds. Um, almost 59% of the department's budget is for personnel expenses. Um, as shown in the pie chart on page two, the state operations program includes funding for the Free State Challenge Academy um, and the Honor Guard. It receives just over $2 million um, or about 6.4% of the total budget. The FCA is a residential um, and following intervention phase for 16 to 18 year olds who have dropped out of high school. Um, or, or who are at risk of dropping out, it will be discussed further in the key observation section of the analysis. Almost 30% of the budget supports um, the Army National Guard and Air National Guard. Um, the Air National Guard tends to be more federally focused in its mission, um, accounting for the difference in funding between the two programs. Um, the administrative headquarters receives the remaining 5.2%. Uh, exhibit two on page three shows the proposed budget for the agency and how much it grows. Uh, the general fund allowance increases by 2.5%, um, while the federal fund allowance in grows by $1.2 million uh, or 6.4%. Um, growth in the budget comes largely from personnel expenses, um, such as regular earnings, as well as from um, the following sources, which are described um, at the top of page four, preventative ma maintenance contracts for aging Army National Guard facilities adds 1.2 million in state and federal dollars to the department's budget. Um, $400,000 in state funds were provided to leverage matching funds from the Department of Defense. Uh, a major change, which is not reflected within any of the prior, uh, prior exhibits um, is that the, uh, the budget is not reflective of um, the Maryland Emergency Management Agency becoming the new uh, Maryland Department of Emergency Management. Chapter 287 of 2021 um, renamed MEMA as, uh, as MDEM, um, and authorized the transfer of MEMA's budget from the military department. 
Um, this includes funds as well as personnel. Um, as such, the military department's fiscal 22 working appropriation um, decreased by almost $170 million. Um, a difficult cost to identify in the uh, to identify in the budget uh, is the department's role in Maryland's pandemic response. Um, they're both personnel costs, which are a little bit easier to understand um, or to break out separately, um, as well as costs which may appear as increased utilities um, or wear on state vehicles. Uh, the National Guard uh, has been mobilized several times to assist state and local health, health officials under two types of activations um, that are at the behest of and control of the governor. Uh, state active duty activations are paid for with state funds and may be reimbursed later by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Exhibit three here shows that about 1,700 guardsmen have been mobilized under SAD activations since 2019. Um, about 84% of those activations or the, of those personnel have been connected to the pandemic. Um, activations which occur under Title 32 of the United States Code, however, are paid up front with federal funds. So therefore like the personnel costs associated with T32 activations um, don't then appear within the state's budget. Um, military department reports that there have been two major T32 activations to support COVID-19 relief um, over the last two years. Uh, with the number of guardsmen for those activations varying, but reaching up to 1,500 for each for extended periods. Um, DLS uh, asks, asks that the military department comment and include in its testimony information about um, the costs associated with the mobilization of guardsmen um, to assist with the state COVID-19 response. Uh, moving now to the chart on page six, this shows that there are no changes in the number of regular and contractual positions for the department. Um, keep in mind that this chart is not reflective of the disappearance of, or the removal of NEMA positions. Um, however, departmental vacancies are over two and a half times more than budgeted. Uh, the key observations begin on page seven of the analysis. Um, exhibit four shows the percentage of air and army facilities that are currently in fully functional status. Uh, one of the responsibilities of the military department is to build and maintain the armories and other facilities used by MDNG, um, as all facilities and real property support its operation and training needs. Um, the Army National Guard facilities have improved in recent years in terms of their fully functional status, um, increasing from 23% in fiscal 2016 to 37% in fiscal 21, um, although this fails to meet their goal of 95% functionality. Um, the department will be receiving $1.2 million for Army National Guard facility maintenance contracts, um, as I noted earlier, um, and we're asking that the department uh, comment, including their testimony, um, additional information on how the funds will be used, um, and should also describe the impact that facility functionality has on current operations. Uh, the second observation is illustrated with exhibit five on page eight. Uh, it's, it is a goal to attain 90% of the federally defined authorized troop strength for both the Army and Air National Guards. Um, fiscal 2021 represents the first year that that goal has not been exceeded since 2008. Uh, the um, department achieved 100% uh, in both fiscal 19 and, and 2020. And in their uh, conversations with the Department of Legislative Services has noted that there's a difference uh, in the authorized troop percentage rates between the Army National Guard and Air National Guard. Um, DLS asks that the department comment on the decline in troop strength in fiscal 21 um, and the efforts that will be taken for the Maryland National Guard to reach its goal in the future. Uh, the last observation is uh, shown on page nine. 
the military department was asked to provide a report on the impact of the pandemic on the uh, FCA in the joint chairman's report from last year. Um, exhibit six shows the number of students in the FCA and some performance measures for the program. Uh, typically, two classes of about 100 students are held annually, um, but no classes were held in fiscal 2021 with approval from the National Guard Bureau. Uh, most FCA staff were relocated to support pandemic relief measures um, during fiscal 21, and FCA used its budgeted funds uh, to initiate construction on infrastructure improvements uh, for future students and staff in the program. We ask that the military department comment on the status of the FCA facility upgrade projects. Um, and as operations in fiscal 2022 uh, resume, I would like to note that uh, the number of students has also been impacted uh, for the second year or for the second year um, to assist in achieving social distancing. Two classes of about 75 students were planned instead. And I believe in the department's testimony, it includes the um, number of actual uh, students who began the who began the program for both uh, classes held during fiscal 2022. Um, though the National Guard Bureau authorized the program to be fully staffed despite the reduced class size, um, the military department reports it is yet to recruit and hire for all of the intended positions for the FCA. Um, we ask that the department comment on the efforts to resume classes for FCA students and recruit staff for the program. The Department of Legislative Services recommends concurring with the governor's allowance. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for that analysis. Any questions from, from the subcommittee? Senator Eckert. Thank you very much. Um, just a point of personal privilege on that, I guess, and just compliment. Thank you all for being so responsive through the pandemic. I know we saw your uh, very highly visible down on the Eastern Shore. So thank you for that presence and that engagement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. So I see no questions, Ms. Miller, for you. So we'll go ahead and turn uh, the Zoom over to Major General Gowan. And if you want to introduce those who are with you, you're welcome to do that. I join with Senator Eckert and thanking you all for your service, particularly during the pandemic. And I would be remiss or unfair if I didn't mention Ms. Miller's pointed out vacancies and, and uh, recruitment. And so we're asking all of our responders, uh, our uh, budget leaders to talk to us about that. So you can incorporate that in your response. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, Madam Chair, thanks so much for, for uh, giving us this opportunity today and uh, um, good afternoon to you and the rest of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to update you all on act activities of the department and to respond to the issues uh, and recommendations contained in the operating budget analysis prepared by the Department of Legislative Services analyst, uh, Ms. Madeline Miller. And thank you, Ms. Miller, for your hard work. I'm joined by Several members here today of the Maryland Military Department, they're all on the line. I've got with me my Director of Joint Staff, Brigadier General Adam Flash, my Chief of Staff of the Maryland Military Department, uh, Nathan Crum, Director of Legislative and Government Affairs, Catherine Kelly, Dr. Andrew Yawkey, who is my Director of Installations, Ms. Kelly Hammond, who is my Director of Finance, and Mr. Nick Pendell, who is the Director of Human Resources. Um, normally, they kick me in the shins and, and uh, tell me what, uh, what to say uh, sitting right next to me, but we'll have to try to fake it and uh, I'll call on them to uh, help answer some of the tough questions that I've got. Uh, Madam Chair, as you're aware, the members of the Maryland Military Department are called upon to serve and protect our communities, our state and our nation. We're successful by making the most of the talent within our organization. We've dedicated to be inclusive and diverse maximizing the skills and experience of our leaders and members at all levels. We're proud of our team and continue to focus on building an exemplary diverse team. Uh, I'd like to brag a little bit about some of the things that we've done over the past year. 
uh, not the least of which is the, as you've all mentioned, the support that we provided to the state in COVID-19 response. Uh, that includes security and testing at the state house, logistical support for construction, pop-up testing sites, logistical support at the convention center, National Guard testing support teams, mobile vaccination teams, planning support teams to assist the Maryland Department of Health, food distribution missions, PPE transportation, and other distribution missions. So we've, we've been incredibly busy. It's been quite a year. In addition to that, we've provided security uh, in Annapolis and Washington, D.C. for the presidential election and the, president, uh, and the uh, presidential inauguration. We still have a uh, very active counter drug program. They're supporting the state and local law enforcement. This year, they seized over $13 million in illegal drugs. Our Honor Guard has provided 2,520 military funerals. Um, the agency formerly known as MEMA was a former component of our agency. And with that there, they supported the coordination establishment of vaccination clinics, mobile, vac mobile vaccination clinics, booster shots, testing efforts, contact tracing and ongoing community outreach. And we work diligently with uh, um, MDEM now, formerly MEMA, to help uh, facilitate their transition to what is now the Maryland Department of Emergency Management. And finally, our Maryland Defense Force, MDDF, assisted in COVID-19 response. These are the all volunteer folks. Um, they, don't, they do it for no pay, they're great, great Americans. Uh, they provided by providing staffing support for vaccination and testing efforts at the Baltimore Veterans Administration Medical Center and uh, Maryland Ashgar Free State Challenge Academy and the New Shiloh Baptist Church. Uh, those are my opening remarks, ma'am. I can go into starting to answer some of the specific questions if you like. Okay. And, and I'll answer some of these personally, and then I'll call on some of my team to help me with the rest of them. The first one is... Uh, Please explain and identify the costs associated with the mobilization of the guardsmen to assist with the state COVID-19 response. Um, so normally when we respond to a mission at the request of the governor, it's on state active duty. This is uh, quite different this time. We were able to utilize what is referred to as uh, 502F funding, which is U.S. Code 30, uh, Title 32, which means that it's actually paid for by the federal government. The vast majority of it was paid for by the federal government. There were some folks that we brought on and stayed on state active duty, the people that were doing like cyber support missions. They can't do that on, on federal funding. So was, uh, that's a relatively small portion. The vast, vast majority of that, uh, the soldiers and airmen were on Title 32 status. However, that that doesn't uh, mean it didn't cost the state some of the in some um, uh, non-specific areas. That is to say that when we bring them into our facilities and when we uh, utilize uh, state vehicles and other resources, because it's such a, a large footprint, then then that's going to increase the cost of facilities management and the other costs with with the other resources as we use them. So uh, in addition to that, um, it's just increased wear and tear on everything. So uh, uh, that, 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 that uh, ultimately requires additional resources to, uh, to um, repair. Uh, and then also, of course, similar increases in utilities, water, heat, et cetera. Uh, any questions about that before I move on? Okay. The next question is, uh, we should comment on the projects that this additional funding will be used for, as well as the impact that the number of facilities and fully functional status has on current ops. And I forget if I'm gonna call in Mr. Crum or Dr. Yawkey, but I'll turn it over to those guys. They're probably sitting right next to each other. Uh, thank you, General Gowan. Uh, this is Andrew Yawkey. Madam Chair, subcommittee members, thank you for the opportunity to share some insights. Uh, the military department has taken a much more comprehensive approach to facilities management. Uh, this is nested within the Board of Public Works, as well as the Department of General Services um, view of what needs to be done as far as infrastructure management. We have, uh, and it's also nested within best practices for the industry. We've increased uh, and used additional funding and we use FY23 additional funding, uh, largely for preventative maintenance, 
Now our preventative maintenance will be focused on any new facilities that have been built because we want to sustain those facilities for life cycle and beyond. And preventive maintenance is a proven method to do that. Uh, we've also focused it on some of our intermittent age facilities as opposed to, and we haven't funded preventive maintenance on those facilities, obviously, that we're divesting. Um, this action provides us the opportunity to sustain our equipment and systems, and it's also for life cycle replacements that are not extremely costly and, costly and wouldn't be shifted to the capital budget. Uh, the percentage of facilities in functional status only represents 35 of our major facilities. And that's 35 critical facilities for our activation to support the government. Those are what are commonly called or have been called armories. They're now called readiness centers because they're a centralized focus of training and preparing soldiers to respond to both state and federal missions. Uh, that makes up about 26 facilities. The remaining nine facilities are our maintenance centers, which uh, maintain all of our federal equipment and support the soldier in support of the government. Now, beyond these 35 facilities, we also have 200, or within that 35 facilities, we have a total of 288 buildings. Now, as you can imagine, most of our focus is on sustaining our 35 facilities, but we also spend some funding on the remaining buildings. Some of those are warehouses uh, receiving new equipment from the federal government. Some of those are, are simply uh, supply sites and, and so forth to, again, it's in support of our readiness centers and maintenance sites. Um, for facility support, the majority of tasks are uh, supported by our internal staff. Uh, we rely on vendors for more complex or lengthy repairs, or obviously use our procurement office when we're doing uh, renovations or additions to facilities. Um, and with our maintenance staff, obviously we're able to maintain readiness and, and prioritize support to our facilities. And it's certainly more responsive than awaiting a procurement. In the event when maintenance projects are deferred, this can lead to, and the reason we've started preventative maintenance is um, we, we didn't wanna have reoccurring situations where manufacturers warranties were voided for lack of preventative maintenance. Um, but through preventative maintenance, we've also identified some additional equipment that needs repaired. And, and some of that we have, uh, or a large portion of that we've done ourselves, um, sometimes rebuilding a system as opposed to buying a much more expensive system on the market. Uh, it's been proven that poorly maintained facilities not only inhibit the military department and National Guard's ability to operate effectively, and be most responsive to the governor. It also impacts retention of uh, quality personnel. We've been in the process of, of divesting some facilities readiness centers. We've had recently, we've done that with some that dated back to, uh, one was actually built in 1903. And we have some buildings in the divestiture process that were presently built in 1927 and 1935. So I think you can appreciate how military equipment has evolved and it's important to have facilities that are configured to meet the needs of the, of the modern soldier. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Questions? Any questions on that or should I move on to the next uh, subject, ma'am? Looks like you can keep going for now. Okay. So the next question had to do with their decline in troop strength in fiscal year 21 and, and the extent to which the pandemic has influenced that troop strength. Um, so it, this breaks down into Army and Air, two completely different methodologies. And I should first point out that unlike the active component, recruiting is the responsibility of each state in, in the National Guard. So it's, it's a little different animal. Um, we, we have our own recruiting goals to meet. And uh, the Army has done a great job over the past 
oh, I'd say four or five years to, to bring up their numbers. And right now they're sitting at 96.5%, which is really good. It's above the 90% standard. They, it has dipped a little bit uh, very recently. And I think that's more of a bookkeeping um, uh, trend than anything else. They've actually cleaned out some of the, the folks that have been sitting on our books that weren't really coming to drill, but it's really, it's not, it's not simply a matter of crossing them off the list. It, it takes a while to get them out of the system. And they've done that. Now it's reflecting in our numbers, but we're, we're bringing that back up. The Air National Guard side, a little different story. They've had some challenges. And we, over the past year, have switched out the leadership, switched out most of the recruiters, and got a whole new, fresh new team. We brought on um, some of the some of our best and brightest from the, from the formations and put them into recruiting. In addition to that, we're opening up two new storefronts, one in Frederick County and the other in Harford County, and, uh, and we're adding on new recruiters this year. So hope to bring that number up. They're sitting at about 80, almost 88% right now. So that we're, we're heading to in the right direction. The, the specific question is whether or not that has, whether the pandemic influenced that. I think so. The Army this year didn't make their numbers, big Army. And I think it's a, that's a function of you know, just about everyone else, you know, all the other businesses out there that are having a hard time filling their positions. We have, it's really, really difficult to fill positions uh, to recruit these days. The, the limitations on us, the, the, the specific requirements for the candidates, for the recruits, gets more and more strict every year. And uh, it's something that we have to deal with. And uh, it's a leadership challenge. Any questions on that, ma'am? Madam Chair. Senator Rosapep, the Vice Chair of Budget and Tax has a question. I have a couple of questions, actually. So they're sort of unrelated to each, well, they're related but unrelated. First question is, I have the impression, I don't know much about the National Guard, I apologize. My impression is that we are relatively small among the states in terms of scale. Is that correct or incorrect? I'd say we're a we're 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 on the medium size. Okay. Um, probably just below medium. Okay. Is that our decision or the federal government's decision or history uh, or what is that? Uh, I, I think what you're talking about is the the size of the organization relative to the population. Is that correct? I guess I am. I mean, I just had the impression we had this conversation with Secretary of Health the other day in terms of just the scale of the National Guard that he was able to use on the COVID crisis. And there are other states that's, that seem yeah. to have much greater it, capacity. You know, it's an interesting question. It, 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 uh, it's relevant because states like Florida and California and even Texas that use, uh, that, that, that use the National Guard much more uh, than I would say even their population size. I mean, you think about California, it's huge. But then look how much they use National Guard for things like forest fires. And and I have that general impression from watching the news, too. So you're, you're, Exactly. You're, and, it, and Florida, too, for hurricanes. So a lot of those agents, General, have come up online to say the same thing. Like, look, we need more force structure in the state. I know we're big states, but we, but by ratio of the size of the force to the population, we're underserved. And the way that National Guard Bureau decides which states get force structure and which don't are based on metrics, basically. You know, how well you can fill the, the, the force structure that you've got and how well you'd be able to fill a force structure if we gave you more. So there's states like Alabama and Pennsylvania and Minnesota, which are, you know, they pale, the size of the population pales in comparison to Florida and Texas and places like that, but they've actually got more National Guard infrastructure. And it's because they're able to fill those positions. A lot of it has to do with the population. One of the things that we've done here in Maryland is try to match the types of unit to um, the, uh, the types of population skills that we've got out there. That's why we're really big in, in MI, military intelligence. We're really big in cyber. It's because we've got uh, those types of um, industry here in Maryland, and we can draw from that. So uh, I, it's a long answer. You, you kind of touched a nerve there uh, for, for us and then for a, more so for a lot of other tags. When those tags brought that up, they brought us into the conversation because we're below the line compared to other states as well. But my answer back to them was, don't give us units we can't fill. Don't give us infantry units. If you want to give us more units, give us more medical units, 
uh, military intelligence units, cyber units, and things like that. Well, let me ask you a question related to that, though. I mean, so, so you're basically saying the the allocation is by the it's a federal decision, not a state decision. Yes, uh, if you consider National Guard Bureau to be federal, then yes, it, okay. it's kind of a it, they are federal, um, but they're still part of Guard Nation. Right, but it, but it, it, it it's above our pay grade. Here above my pay grade, yes. Well, I mean, but we above, fight above for our it. pay grade too, is what you're saying. That's what I'm trying to clarify. Oh, absolutely. You're pay, you're you're not in the equation at all, unfortunately. Yeah, that that, I mean, that, you, can, that you can you can uh, you can lobby on our behalf, but uh, I think at the end of the day, the decision okay. goes to the chief of the National Guard Bureau, and then I think uh, I mean, and they are actually Title Ten officers, so it does fall under Big Army and Big Air Force. And and I presume that's because, from their point of view, the fundamental raise on detriment for the National Guard is national security. It absolutely is. We're an op- first and foremost, we're an operational reserve. And that's why it goes back to filling the units. And that's why you say, you know, we're strong in military intelligence and cyber and so forth, which exactly. is, is important for the United States, but a little less important for dealing with uh, vac- vaccinating people. Correct. <laughs> gotcha. So I got, I got a couple other questions, Madam Chair, if I might. Why, sure, Senator. Thank you. The short so, ones. <laughs> so how do you recruit? You mentioned recruitment, but I don't really understand it. I mean, give, give me the short version of who are you recruiting and how are you recruiting? Well, we've got a, let's say I might turn it over to some people like Nate Crum used to be my recruiting attention battalion commander. So I might let him answer it. But just the, the, the short answer that might scratch your itch is that I, I create a recruiting and retention battalion. These are full-time soldiers on the, on both army and air side, and they go out into the population and, and then, uh, and then seek um, potential soldiers and airmen that we then put through, you know, we, we uh, make sure that they, they satisfy all the, the, the upfront requirements. We do all kinds of medical and, and background checks on them. And, and if they, and, and then we start to work through the, the big army recruiting process. Nate, uh, I'm running out of steam. What else, what, what else can you add to that? Hey, sir, it's uh, Jeff Flash. I'll, I'll jump in on that one as uh... So uh, the, the biggest frustration we have in recruiting Maryland's youth is the uh, qualification standards that we follow are the active component standards because the soldier and airman that we recruit has to meet the same standards as their active duty counterpart because we will serve side by side with them in the combat zone as we have for the last 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and sure. everyone has seen that, you know, when – given the opportunity, we serve in those capacities and, and do so well because we maintain high standards. But sure. what we face is a large number of um, potential applicants who uh, automatically screen themselves out of military service because of the standards we maintain. Um, so it's a, a double-edged sword because you do not want a military that is indisciplined or unable to sure. fill its combat role. But it, you know, at the same time, we run into issues. Uh, that, that what we're seeing now in trends is a lot of, a lot of our youth have got um, anxiety issues. Well, if they are put on a certain anxiety medication, they're automatically screened out of military service. So as as we you know we try to work through that, get waivers where we can, uh, and do everything we can to help uh, our Marylanders join our Maryland National Guard. And it's it's a competitive job market. So uh, sure. finding folks who want to serve. Uh, part-time while they work full-time is, is always something we're working hard on. Well, is the, is the recruitment, you say the recruitment standards are the same as for the regular uh, DOD recruitment. Got that. It, do you go through the same process? I mean, do, do the kids take the ASVAB and do you, you know, do you do direct solicitation? Yes, so the, the biggest misunderstanding of the National Guard is we're, we're not a state entity alone. There, there's a state function. We belong to the governors and, and the, right elegance of our constitution, both federal and state, grants the governor authority over the militia. Right. We are a component to the United States Army, United States Air Force. I hold a commission as a general yep. officer, as does my boss, and, yep. and our members are card-carrying members of the Department of Defense. Um, and we're in a training status normally under the authority of the governor. Uh, when we're in 502S status, uh, we're on federal status under the authority of the governor. Uh, and when we're in state active duty, then we're state funded under the authority of the governor. The only time we fall under the authority of the president is when we're right. federalized. And yep. But my, my question is related to recruiting is, I mean, I, I generally know how DOD does recruiting 
for the full-time services. Are you integrated into that or do you do separate recruiting? If I may, yeah, please. actually, my name is Nate Crum. I, I actually served two tours in recruiting, culminating with JAG Commander for the Maryland Army National Guard recruiting system. Great. So there, we are actually in competition with the act proponent. Uh, we recruit from the same base. We recruit people to stay home and support the, the state, whereas on the federal side, they recruit people to go elsewhere uh, and support the nation. Uh, so our prim primarily what we do is we do a scientifically based process by which we identify through demographics where recruitable populations are. Then we array our forces in such a way as to determine uh, where we can find uh, those personnel. Uh, we screen them, we take them through a process which is the same as General Flash said, uh, same as the active component and uh, potentially they become soldiers or airmen for the National Guard. What, what gives us a competitive advantage is what the state provides. And, and by the governor fully funding state tuition, uh, it allows us to differentiate somewhat from our active component because our, our guardsmen get all the same benefits uh, that an active duty member would get. And then when you add that on top of the state benefit, they can go to school for free in Maryland uh, which gives us an advantage, and it keeps our talent here in Maryland. I, yeah. I am unabashedly uh, pro-Maryland, Maryland first all the time, and so we are always trying to talk folks into staying here, um, and we continue to work closely uh, in all the zip codes around the state to, to give That's every true. Marylander an opportunity to make a difference. As a public school kid who went to Baltimore County at Lansdowne, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, teachers who would question whether I, I was going to make much of myself and it was the National Guard uh, that put that that opportunity in front of me and, and and gave me the life I had and that's something that we you know all, every one of us wants to give to our fellow Marylanders an opportunity to serve and to apply their trade. And that, 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 that's great I got one last question how many people do you need to recruit a year? 600 about that. 600 a year? Wow. Six roughly six to eight hundred a year to, to cover the losses yeah, yeah I guess. that's just the that's just the army side though right the air side is a similar uh it's probably about 150 to 200 a year gotcha wow that's fascinating i, I won't take up more time in the subcommittee but if if someone with the guard would would be in touch with my office i'd like to have an offline conversation in more depth about this yes sir You're, we're on it thank you thank you madam chair hey so, thank you senator yes i'm sure they'll be happy to accommodate <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I think you had answered all but one. Had you finished the responses? Uh, there's two more that have to do with the same topic and that's the Free State Challenge Program. And I'm gonna turn it over right. to Mr. Crum to answer those questions. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, um, question, I believe that's uh, next is department should comment on the status of Free State Challenge uh, facility upgrade projects. Uh, free State, facility uh, upgrades have not yet been completed. Uh, we've requested that the Department of General Services delay the start of construction of the Free State Academy uh, facility upgrades from uh, January 2022 to June of 2022. And the purpose for that is because we need to have appropriate housing available for the cadets. We couldn't have construction ongoing at the same time that the cadets were housed in the same building. Uh, so with relocation of the cadets to uh, another viable area, uh, we'll be able to uh, begin construction in June of 2022. Uh, and that we've already coordinated that with contract with DGS, so there should be no significant issues with the contract proceeding on schedule. I believe the next question regards uh, Free State Challenge Academy again, uh, and that is about uh, the resumption of classes and for recruiting for the program in particular. Uh, Free State Challenge Academy conducted an intake of 87 cadets for class 57 on the 11th of July, 2021. Uh, National Guard Bureau authorized class 57 size to be reduced by 25% of the normal size and that's associated with uh, COVID-19 and the requirements for social distancing. Uh, as you're perhaps aware, uh, the cadets are, are 
in a quasi-military environment in a barracks environment. So it's rather tight under normal circumstances, therefore the reduction. Uh, 63 cadets of class 57 graduated from Free State on the 20th of November, November 2021. Uh, class 58 was similarly reduced by 25%. Uh, for the purpose of COVID-19. They conducted an intake of 76 cadets for 58 on the 9th of January of 2022, and are currently 58 cadets still enrolled in the program at this time. Uh, as noted in our written testimony, uh, we've made a continuous effort to fill a Free State Challenge Academy vacancies. It is challenging because it is a rigorous environment for the cadre. Uh, but the things that we have focused on are uh, we post both in job apps and Indeed uh, to attract a larger pool of qualified candidates. Uh, we are working diligently to expedite the hiring process. Uh, we've held virtual job fairs uh, to fill uh, FCA vacancies. And at, as of this point, this has paid off to the point where we've been able to hire uh, 15 permanent and contractual cadre. Uh, and overall, we've hired 21 other permanent contractual personnel, such as counselors, in support of the program. Uh, Free State Challenge Academy has not changed operations since the JCR report response in August of this past year, but intends to resume operations for the class size of 100% capacity as soon as the pandemic conditions allow. Uh, that is, let's say that it's passed, uh, and upon completion of the facility renovations discussed earlier. Renovations are expected to be completed around February of 2023. Pending your questions, ma'am, this completes uh, my portion. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Seeing no questions for the subcommittee, we extend our thanks to the analyst and to the Maryland Military Department for your responses. Members, that concludes our hearings for today. We will gather again as the Health and Human Services Subcommittee tomorrow, after, uh, tomorrow morning at 1030. And with that, meeting adjourned. Everyone